Okay, Bessel functions are a priori solutions of the Bessel's equation, which we obtain while solving the wave equation on a disk, right? Um, for that case, we had uh, this alpha being actually integers, n. Um, but there are cases where you get similar equations for uh, when you try to solve a, a wave equation on a sphere, you get something similar, but in that case, you get uh, non-integer values here. So uh, I want to uh, talk about Bessel functions in general. Now, the solution of this will always have the form of C1. We call the Bessel function of the first kind as, as Jn, x. And C2, the sec this, this is the first kind. The second kind is written as Yn. And I should have looked up some history why people use those letters, but I have no idea. It's just uh, customary to use Jn for the Bessel function of the first kind and Yn for the Bessel function of the second kind. Uh, okay, so what happens is that in general when you try to solve this using the power series method, uh, you, you usually fail because of this, this x squared in, in front. Um, this x squared is what we call singularity because if you have a usual power series solution for x to the n, then uh, the, you're, you're saying that your solution is a smooth function. It's infinitely differentiable. It behaves really nicely around zero. It has the value of y0, y prime of 0, y double prime of 0, so you can differentiate as much as you like and you can evaluate at 0. That's what you mean when you try to find a solution of this one in this case. But then, uh, if you try to plug this in general for general values of alpha, you'll see that it's not possible because what this x squared is doing is like, if you divide by x squared, you, you get x over x squared, which is like 1 over x squared and, and something over x squared in the denominator. So all these things, they're like, uh, they, they give you singularities in the coefficients. And that it, that's why it prohibits these solutions from existing. So uh, instead of doing this, you need a slightly different approach, which is called the Frobenius method. Frobenius method modifies this by saying, well, it might have some extra x to the alpha. Oh, not alpha, so let's use r. x to the r, and from 0 to infinity. And having this x to the r allows your solutions to have singularities. So for example, if r is negative 1, what does that mean? That means the very first term starts with 1 over x, or a0 over x. So if a0 is non-zero, this will have an undefined value at zero, it will have some singularity, right? So th those are called, instead of power series, it's called the Laurent series. Laurent series are things that have negative powers. Yes? Um, why the first time we We don't know the R, what R is. Uh, I mean, we will eventually have to figure out what R what works, okay? okay. It turns out that the, the R that does work, if you plug it into here and do the various calculation, uh, for this special function equation, R is either positive alpha or negative alpha. So that, that's what it means, right? Uh, I mean, yes. The first, I see, I see the first term is A, A0 itself. Yeah, yeah, but then a0 times x to the r, if r is negative 1, it will start from here. That's what I'm saying. Oh. In the case when r is negative 1. Yeah. 
if r is negative 2, it's going to start from here. All these are singularities. So Frobenius method allows for singularities at 0. And not only that, it can account for things like square root of x. Right? See, if r is 1 half, you can start with this, the 1 half r. Those also have singularities at 0. The function itself doesn't have singularity, but if you differentiate this, the derivative has a singularity. Right? So uh, it was uh, Frobenius' insight that uh, even if you have coefficients that, are, that have singularities, uh, that there are like two types of singularities. One is called regular, the other is irregular. And, and if the singularity is not too bad, I can't explain. Say, uh, I have some videos on Frobenius method, so if you if you watch them, you, you'll know what I mean. But for a regular singular case, you always have a, a Frobenius solution this way, and, and uh, the, the the equation that R has to satisfy is called the initial equation. For the case of Bessel, the initial equation has the solution alpha and negative alpha. So what happens is that Jn of x has the very first term starting from x to the alpha, where alpha is this value, plus a1 x to the alpha plus 1. So that's all. And then y sub n has the value that starts from a0 x to the, well, this, this is different a0, so let's call this b0. b0 x to the negative alpha plus b1 x to the negative alpha plus 1, so and so on. So, it's yes. I still have a question. Yes. So, in the past, actually you've solved Bessel's equation, mm -hmm. but you didn't say, well, there might be singularities. Just oh, in class, uh, what I did was I, I solved it for the case when alpha was an integer. Integer. If it's an integer, then this is an integer, and in that case, it, it, it's a regular power series. So one of the solutions just becomes a usual power series that we know of, but then it's a second order, so there must be a second solution. I didn't discuss what happens to the second solution. It's very, very complicated if you try to solve this one. Um, yeah. You mean here alpha alpha isn't an integer? I'm I'm actually extending to the case when alpha is not an integer. Uh, oh, so in the past you solved J n. Yeah, we I, we just looked for J uh, in class. I I either came up with J of three or J of four or J of oh, five, yeah. something like J6, that. J six. Oh, J six. Okay, so I solved this for J six oh, in class. So yeah. so now you want to find Y n. Uh, that's what you want to do. So no, no, no it, it, it's that's what I don't want to. I mean, there there exists some solution here, but it's it's it, it's nearly impossible. I on my channel I have a video where I, I do the series solution for n equals to one, and that takes like uh, what almost two hours on the video, and it's just next to impossible. It's really really complicated. Yeah. So now the alpha is uh, just non-negative. Real number, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, alpha is a real value. Yeah, alpha is a real value. So, yeah. can, can yeah. you explain why you said that x to the r well, here? <laughs> oh, so, so in the case when alpha is not an integer, well, even if it's an integer, one solution starts like x to the n, and the other one starts with x to the negative n. The other one will have a singularity. So, it will be a non physical solution. This is a physical solution. Yes? I just had a question, is it actually alpha and alpha plus one just because when we did the decimal functions, is it, does it come out to like x? Oh, yeah, 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 right, 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 yeah. so plus, plus two. So they, they, they kind of skip, yeah, but in that case, like all the, all the odd ones came out to be zero, yeah, so that, that's another good point. Right. Uh, I'm not so sure about this one though. Maybe this one. Yeah, I'm not so sure what happens here. Maybe this one will still have that. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> but but what I'm trying to say here is that uh, one of them will have a singularity and this one will it. Right? So in yes. the past you only solve for J n, but here you want to find a general solution for both of. Yeah, these. I mean. If, 
for so you add an uh, X to the R term, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so the more general type of okay. solution will have the Frobenius type solutions. Yeah. Is that okay? All right. Okay. Uh, So suppose you, you you did that work. So so let's say you you worked really hard and uh, eventually you found out that this is the, the type of solution uh, that that doesn't blow up. Uh, it, it's finite at zero plus alpha. The minus alpha one will be the, the one that's blowing uh, blowing up. And uh, if you plug that in, and that's another long calculation, which I want to skip. And, and, and uh, yeah, this this is rather doable. I, I have a video on the case when I do uh, for n equals to one. But we also did the case when n is six. So you you've seen it before, okay? So for for that generic case, what happens is uh, it's a formula that I don't remember. That's why I wrote it down here. Uh, the solution J alpha, oh, I should have written this as alpha 3. So J alpha in general is the summation from m equals to 0 through infinity of negative 1 to the nth power over m factorial gamma uh, m plus alpha plus 1 of x over 2, 2m plus alpha. Uh, yeah, so you, you can see the gamma function that we discussed. So when alpha is an integer, what is this like? It's like m plus n factorial. If alpha is an n, that's what this is going to be like. Okay? Now, uh, y alpha, on the other hand, and this one, I just I'm just writing for completeness, but you don't really have to know. Uh, is defined as J alpha of x cosine alpha x alpha pi, sorry. Alpha pi minus J minus alpha of x over sine alpha of pi. Now this wouldn't be defined if alpha is n because sine and pi is zero, right? So this is only for the case when alpha is not an integer. But uh, if you have y of n of x, if this is an integer, then it's defined as limit uh, alpha going to that integer with y alpha of x. So that's, that's how you get the other one. Uh, you could also just uh, plug this form with minus alpha into the equation to get it, but uh, uh, if alpha is not a, not an integer or a half integer, that's somewhat doable. But there's this strange thing that goes on when the two values uh, differ. So, so two two values of r, if they differ by an integer, then you might have a logarithmic singularity somewhere, and then. It makes things really, really hard, and that's exactly what happens for alpha equal to one. Uh, one and negative one, they differ by an uh, integer, and if, if you try to solve it, you end up with the logarithmic singularity. It's, it's very bad. Okay, so uh, that's what these are. Now, One thing I want to say is that for the case when you have alpha equal to one half, then let's see what happens. Uh, well, it, it, it's it's a bit hard to do it here, but it turns out that it's equal to square root of g 
2 over pi z times sine of oh, pi x times sine of x. So for the case when alpha is 1 half, it's actually expressible by known functions. But other than that, and there are some, some other half integers like gamma of 3 halves and so on and so on. The, the half integer ones, uh, you, you can try to express it using some square roots and also sines or cosines. But then uh, in most other cases, it's, you can't ex express it using the basic functions. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there is in general an approximation that works, which is to say that the, when x is really big, then this is somewhat similar to square root of 2 over pi x cosine of uh, x minus alpha x over or alpha pi over 2 minus pi over 4. Yeah, that's that's the approximate formula. So that, that kind of gives you some idea of what's going on. It's like a, uh, cosines and sines are called sinusoidal curves, right? Anything, any curve that looks like a sine, sine curve that's called sinusoidal. Sinusoidal, have you heard of this word? Sinusoidal, yeah. So it's like sinusoidal, but what's happening to the amplitude? Is it increasing or decreasing? decreasing. It's decreasing like? 1 over square root of x. That's what's happening to this. It's, so uh, roughly, Bessel functions are like, it goes like a sinusoidal function, but their amplitude is like decreasing by 1 over square root of x. Now, uh, so given that, I want to show you some, some pictures. So. Uh, Next time, I'll, I'll try to use the computer to actually draw these graphs, but uh, to give you some idea of how they look like. Um, J0 of x looks like this. this. This is J0 of x. So, so it's like a cosine function that, whose amplitude gradually goes down. And then j1 of x, well, j1 of, j1 of x starts from something a0 x to the first power, right? So therefore, the value at 0 would be 0, right? So it's going to be like that. So that will be j1 of x. Okay, if you're taking notes, you might want to use a different colored one for this one and yeah, the other one, so it's not confusing. Now, j2 of x is going to start with x squared, right? So it's going to start at 0, but it will have a, a it will, near 0, it, it's going to act like a parabola. So it's going to go like that, and then go up, and then, then do that. And I don't know exactly where that ends, but it's, it's like this. Again, the amplitude will go down. So, so this, this one will be j2 of x. And the j3 of x will be even more like, it will, it will since it starts from x cubed, it, it will hold on to 0 for longer and then go up. Okay? So that's what's going to happen. On the other hand, uh, the, the y0 of x will have a singularity that's like a log, log, log function. So that, that's that's y0 of x. And then uh, the y1 of x will be like that. And the next, next ones will start having all these singularities. Uh, y of 1 of x will, will behave like 1 over x in the singularity. So, something over. So y1 of x will start from a0 over x as its power series. So it's like, it has a singularity that's like 1 over x, y2 of x will have a0 over x squared, and 
So that, that's what, how the graph will look like. So that's somewhat of a feel for the Bessel functions. But I, I have yet another, another thing to share about this Bessel function. And it, has, it's, uh, it has to do with the fact that the amplitude is decreasing like square root. Uh, so let, let me start from a, a physical system that's dealt in any basic physics course. You have a spring with spring constant k, right, with a mass m, right? Well, what is this thing called? mass spring system or also simple harmonic os oscillator. So uh, the equation for the, the differential equation that governs this one is like my double prime. The second derivative is the acceleration. So f equal to ma plus uh, kx equal to zero, or ky equal to zero. And uh, this is the Hooke's law, right? Uh, f equals to negative kx. That's it. So, and instead of x, I have y. And this is just f equals to negative kx, and you, you replace f by ma, second derivative. You get, you get this, right? OK, so you have this, and there, there's something conserved in this system. This, this, by the way, will never stop, right? It will always go back and forth. Once you root, you, know, you, you push it to one side and release it, it will just go back and forth. Because there's there's no uh, friction in here, so it just goes on forever, right? Now, you could multiply both sides by y prime. And you can integrate both sides by dx or dt. And the result is that, uh, see, if you have y prime squared prime, use, using the chain rule, what is this? 2 comes down, you have 2y prime times. You pull the inside function and differentiate, so what do I write? You've never dealt with anything like this. y prime squared prime, what's that? 2 comes down. Inside function, you bring it outside and differentiate. What do I put here? Double y double prime. So if you put it like this, that's exactly this part, right? Y double, y double prime, prime times y prime is exactly this one. So if you integrate, this becomes 1 half m y prime squared. Okay. Plus, if you integrate this, is 1 half k y squared. And if you integrate 0, it's a constant. Okay, this is physics class, let's say, temporary of physics class. Who recognizes this term? If you take the position, differentiate once that same as? Yeah, so velocity and velocity squared times 1 half, one half mv squared, that's called kinetic energy, right? Okay, that's kinetic energy. How about this one? This one, I think people know less. This is the potential energy stored inside the, the spring. That's because, uh, you see, force is equal to negative kx. So if you integrate this from some 0 to some, some given x0, then it gives you negative 1 half kx squared. So, so this much is the potential energy stored in the spring if you pull it or push it. Okay? So, have you, huh? have you multiplied uh, y prime both sides? Uh, it's a standard trick that people do. Okay, okay so, so what does this say? It says kinetic energy plus the potential energy is equal to? Constant. Constant, right? Okay. Uh, so that's what you have. And then, uh, so, so, Let's think about what's happening at the, at the peak. So when this is going back and forth, when it's at the maximum case, what's the velocity? Zero. 
zero. So in that case, kinetic energy is zero, right? So if you look at the maximum amplitude, you, you can conclude that for sinusoidal movements, if you have like, if the solution of this will be like cosine something and sine something, right? So you, but if, if you look at the graph of this thing get going back and forth, it's, it's sinusoidal, right? So that sinusoidal thing, uh, you know that the energy, the total energy stored in this system, which is C, right? so let's, let's call this E. The total energy stored in the system is proportional to the max amplitude squared. Right, because uh, and at the maximum it's squared, right? So you have maximum amplitude squared. And uh, wh what happens is that in, in the case when we had the, the string tied in two ends and we, we solved them, we, we solved them in terms of the sine functions. So you, you had like a sine function that looks like this. I should have talked about this more, but these are called the stationary waves. There's a sine curve that looks like that, and there's like a one that goes, Yeah, like that one, and then there's one that has like uh, four of these bumps or stuff like that. Those are called stationary waves, and, and, and these, if you look, look at just one point, you see that they are like sinusoidal curves, right? So what you see is that uh, if you have something that behaves like a wave, right, then the, the energy stored in that wave is like the... Uh, amplitude squared. You get that? That's like the intuitive understanding of what's happening here, okay? But then, we're, we're not talking about this case, we're talking about the drum head, right? We, we got this equation when we were trying to solve the, the wave equation when you had the drum fixed on, on, the, on the frame, right? And think about what happens if you take this midpoint and then you take a stick and you hit it and now you have some waves, right? So what happens is that the, the middle point will be fluctuating like a sine curve, right? but then that energy is going to spread out so that the, the energy that you have here is going to be spread out like that, and they have to have the same energy, right? So if the energy is evenly spread out in this vibration, what do you think is going to happen with the amplitude? Well, this length is r times bigger than this length, right? So uh, that's where this this thing comes comes from. You 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 can kind of oh suddenly I forgot a good way to explain this. But what's happening is that uh, because the energy stored in in one radius r has to be same as the 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 one smaller as it spreads out the amplitude has to decrease like 1 over square root of x. That's what's happening. That's what Bessel function is like. Okay? So Bessel function is like a, a, a cylindrical version of the sinus of the curve where the energy is decreasing so that over the same circle, it has the same energy stored. Does that make sense? Right? Okay. Uh, now, if you have the same reasoning applied to spherical wave function, right? If, if Let's say you have a bowl that's a metal, metal bowl. You, you hit it, then now it's ringing, right? So in, inside of the, the bowl, it's like all these uh, metals like ringing in some configuration. Let's say uh, it's soft, it's all ringing. And what, what, when that happens, uh, this, this vibration will, will now have to have same energy on the spherical shells, right? So uh, there's something called spherical Bessel functions, which is defined as taking the Bessel function and dividing it by another square root of x, and with some more co coefficients. Now, why would they do it this way? Because over there, in the spherical case, now the energy has to decrease like 1 over x. Instead of 1 over square root of x, you have to decrease like 1 over x. So you divide by another square root of x. That's how you get the spherical Bessel functions. So uh, once you have that idea, then, then you can kind of see why Bessel functions are needed. Right? A solid? Huh? Spherical? Uh, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a with, three dimension, right? 
three-dimensional solid sphere, uh, solid ball. Maybe even it's like, if, even if it's uh, filled by air, the air might be like fluctuating yeah. spherically, right? Yeah. Then you would have uh, it cannot be 3D. Like pure surface. It cannot be too yeah, yeah. So, so that's the idea, right? So, uh, so imagine like this: you you have a pond. You go to a pond, and often you like to throw a stone, right? So when you throw a stone, right, and let's say briefly this stone is is hitting a, a middle surface, and it creates a sinusoidal wave, right? And then the it it will spread like a circle, right? And then if the, the energy is not being lost, and in, in practice the energy will be lost, so it will be not be like the, exactly like the vessel functions, but you can kind of imagine the vessel, the, the, the waves going outside and not losing energy, and then the, the picture, the cross-section of that, that uh, circles that's created by throwing a stone, that's going to be like a vessel function. So what, once you have that idea, then Vessel functions look a lot more natural than what you think. The dependent value is some uh, the amplitude, right? Huh? The dependent value is variable is amplitude. So, so as it goes outside, the amplitude would decrease. 